Tonight on PM Express, a conversation about an old age menace we've been battling with as a country, child trafficking. As Joy News' latest hotline documentary reveals, 5,000 cities is just how much a trafficker requires to recruit at least seven children from the northern part of Ghana to work on cocoa farms. Now, what is worrying is that parents of these children are complicit in this illegal trade. Experts say the issues of child trafficking in Ghana is more complicated than it appears. What would it take to end this menace? How do we arrive at a sustainable approach to addressing this threat? That's our focus tonight on PM Express because uh, I want to share with you um, a few of the revelations uh, Kwete Nati uh, found in his investigative piece. An amount of 800 cities to 1,500 is paid to use some children for a year on cocoa farms. These children are mostly transported from the northern and eastern parts of Ghana. They are trafficked and bought to endure long hours of drudgery. Now, according to the traffickers, the value of the trafficked child keep appreciating year after year. This is interesting. This is a human being, and uh, his or her value keep appreciating uh, year after year. You will find out that children would have to work for 1,200. They have to work four years to be able to make up for the 1,400 that has been paid to their parents by the uh, child traffickers. One of the traffickers told the investigative team he would charge 5,000 cities to traffic at least 10 children. 5,000, that means that 1,000 cities for each. He reveals one of the approaches he adopts is to outwit the security officers to forge the national identity of these children so that he can use them to cross the borders this is the reaction from the police so far eight people have been arrested so far after the documentary was um aired now we look at children between 5 to 14 years who are engaged in economic activities and this is uh, also contained in the recent population uh, and uh, housing census and it comes to 229,628 um, this is the gender mix. So you have 130,478 boys and you have 99,150 girls. Now this, and then we have the rural and urban distribution. So these are the services that these children offer wherever they find themselves. So service and sales workers um, in the urban areas, you have 25%. Um, and then in the rural areas, you have... 4.1 percent if you come to skilled agriculture you come to urban areas you have 39 percent and then in the uh, rural areas you have 85 percent now you talk about elementary occupations and this is for the urban areas 12 percent and in the rural areas, you have 7%. And that's how it goes. Now, look at crafts and related trades workers. 23% in the urban areas, 3.5% in the rural areas. And then plants and machine operators and assemblers. And you find out that in the uh, urban areas, you have 1%. In the rural areas, it doesn't seem to happen much, but you can make a comparison of the skilled agriculture, forestry, and fishery workers, and you see the gap. In the rural areas, you have 85%, and in, in the urban areas, you have 39%. Tonight, we are unpacking the complexity of the issues. How complex is this? How can you break it down to um, ensure we end this uh, annual uh, ritual of talking about children who have been trafficked, children who have been made to engage in um, labor, which they're not supposed to do, school children, school-going children who are supposed to be in school, who are being trafficked to work on these farms. Stay with me, I'll introduce my guest after this break. Fifi Boafo, he's head of public affairs at the Ghana Cocoa Board. Uh, he joins me in the studio. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Many happy returns. Great. Uh, also joining us via Zoom is Bright Apia, who is executive director at Child's Rights International. I'm grateful for your time, um, Mr. Bright Apia. 
All right, Eugene Kolote, who is Chief Labor Officer of the Employment and Labor Ministry, has also joined us via Zoom. Abna Anobia Asari, she's also head of Human Trafficking Department at the Ministry of Gender and Social Protection. I'm grateful, uh, lady and gentlemen, that you joined us. Thank you for inviting us. Great. Good evening to everyone. Good. Let me start with you, uh, Eugene Kolote. Um, have you seen those unpleasant scenes in our latest hotline documentary? I mean, children are who are supposed to be in school as young as 11 years being trafficked to work on cocoa farms. How does all of these come across to you? Kindly um, unmute for me, uh, Mr. Kolote. Can you hear me? Yes, loud um, and clear. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, and good evening to your... Uh, listeners and viewers. Um, I don't know how to actually uh, begin with, but um, to say that uh, how do I feel actually seeing children who are supposed to be at school on cocoa farms? I would say it's unfortunate. And it's for nothing that the government needs effort to help eradicate the issue of trafficking and children that are not supposed to be at work uh, on the field, government has come out with a lot of legislation. We have something we call the four P, uh, protection, prevention, prosecution, and then partnership. And uh, along the years, government has come out with various legislation. In fact, I want to say here that government has ratified this very important convention, um, the 29, Convention 29 of the ILO. Government has also ratified Convention 182. It has also ratified Convention 158. These are important conventions which have linked with uh, children. And uh, we, government has followed up with various legislation to help sanitize the employment space and then to remove the issue of child labor from our society. Besides that, um, government has actually come out with this partnership drive where various partners, with civil society organizations, NGOs, and other partners have joined hands with government to address this particular issue. We all know that child labor is a development issue. And to address this particular issue, we have to come up with all these interventions. When we move to uh, leveraging opportunities for children to have access to education, in fact, government over the years has worked seriously to actually put in place a lot of legislation and interventions to enable children that be at school. Some are school feeding, some are school uniforms, some are school uniforms, some um, with a recent um, issue, which is a free SHS. All these are geared towards providing the necessary uh, opportunities to enable the child be at school. In fact, with partnership, permit me to say that we have various stakeholders playing various roles in um, addressing the issue of child labor. And the police have prosecuted a lot of offenders who are actually found uh, um, foul to this particular anchor. So, uh, I don't know, um, the panel will also come with a lot of contributions that government has actually put in place to address the issue of child labor. And uh, child yeah. rights, the executive director there yeah. is a member of some of these important committees mm. uh, working hand in hand. Anobia is also 
a member. Mr. Kolete, uh, it's, it's actually sad that, I mean, with all the things that government has done, we still find ourselves here. Let me bring in uh, Abna Nobi. Abna, uh, have you seen this documentary we're talking about? Hello, Abna, kindly unmute for me. I'm asking if this uh, issue of young children being trafficked to work on cocoa farms has come to your notice. All right, so we'll try and, and bring in uh, Abna. But uh, Mr. Bright Api, I know you have watched this documentary. You must be worried about this phenomenon. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a worrying situation and uh... Uh, because it involves children, uh, we cannot take it for granted. There are issues of uh, child protection. So no matter the form, uh, it should send a signal to us that we should be worried and then take steps. The most important thing for me is that what do we do to address these issues and all that? So uh, I, I believe that uh, the outcome of the documentary has revealed a lot of things, and I must commend uh, Joy FM for doing uh, Joy a Multimedia for doing this work. Uh, because if you look at the documentary, there are a number of things that uh, are surfaced. First, has to do with the, the interconnection that exists between the government institutions and how their responsibilities work together to prevent trafficking in all in all sectors. Again, it also revealed a certain level of uh, a measurement that we've taken for granted, especially where if you'd want to measure issues of trafficking, the processes that you have to go to to be able to do that. And then thirdly, it said once it's about trafficking, it's not only limited to the cocoa sector. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, whatever the situation is, these people engage the process of recruitment. So if you go and you mention it to them that you want the child to go and work in the cocoa sector, their business is not where the child is going to work, but their business is to get the money. So if the negotiation is geared toward cocoa, the cocoa sector, then probably it may not necessarily be that that is the thinking of the people that they want to engage children in the cocoa sector. And, and, and the last thing that for me I see in, the, in this documentary has to do, and then the response that we've gotten from Cocoa Board and other institutions also uh, uh, place us in a situation where we have to really understand st the stakeholders within the cocoa sector and then the role that they are playing. And, and the last one that I'll talk about has to do with the issue of the sustainability program that are running in that sector that uh, the documentary one did not talk about it. And uh, when Cocoa Board was also responding, did not talk about the investment that they themselves have made in relation to uh, dealing with Charlie Bay in the cocoa sector. And then the support system that uh, the buying companies are also giving to uh, uh, them, especially when it comes to the payment of premium and other sustainability program running in that sector. So once we're able to understand this within a certain framework, uh, we should uh, be able to work in order to get rid of uh, uh, this child labor situation that we're talking, especially when it comes to trafficking. Because when you look at the child labor indicators, uh, we have those who are at risk of child labor, we have those who are in the worst forms of child labor, and then we have those who, who are in the hazardous conditions. And, and clearly, you will see the trafficking component falling into uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work forms of child labor, which in most cases are not necessarily related to the cocoa sector, but a general trafficking issue that affects children in, in that. So once we, we get that and we understand the indicators of measurement, then the institution can also find ways and means to deal with the issue in a manner that conforms to the, the laws that we have, and then also the, the identification of the of the real issues. Because for me, if you ask me about what really caused some of these things, I will say that it is purely attitudinal behavior issue. Mm. Because one, the economic, the income levels of farmers in the cocoa sector, on the average is about 1,200. 
Okay. Which means that, and we have data to support that. I'm not just saying this. We have data to support that. Okay. Which means that if a farmer is committed and it's not about behavior, the farmer is able to take care of it farm. Secondly, you will, you will see that the communities in which these people are coming from. So, for instance, you pick a new room where we work in a new room and you realize that there's a lot of hamlets around a new room. Therefore, there are certain issues that may not come to the fore in terms of uh, the, what is happening in some of the hamlets and all that. But the owners of the farms must also be responsible in terms of what they need to do. So for me, the documentary reveals some of these things and it, it presents as a platform for Cocoa Board to tell the, uh, us what their interventions are in relation to the sustainability program. And then we should be able to highlight the work that others are doing. Because now, if you pick the cocoa sector, for instance, in 2015, the enrollment rate of children in the cocoa sector was around uh, 89%. Mm. As we speak, because of the intervention that are going on, mm -hmm. it has increased to 97%, which is, which is, which is very, very remarkable, and yeah. we should not take that for granted. Mm. Again, the number of cocoa farmers that are in the investing now has increased by 10% because of certain scholarship schemes that have been established by some of the sustainability intervention being provided by uh, the, 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 buying company, uh, the buying company, and then the support that Cocoa Board, and then the Labor Department, and then also uh, uh, the Social Welfare Department are providing for them. So these are things that I have seen. These are things that I've participated in. So I, 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 I can provide data in terms of some of the things that are even happening there. And in terms of the scholarship, since 2015 up to date, 200 children have benefited from it, and they are in the tertiary institutions, which is used not to be the story. So gradually, there's a framework that we are all working towards in dealing with this issue. And for Joe FM to provide a platform for the discussion, it should afford us the opportunity to tell the world what the state is doing in terms of dealing with the issue of, 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 of child labor. Thankfully, uh, uh, Fifi yeah. Boafo is here in the studio with me. Fifi, uh, yeah. first of all, update us on uh, the arrest at the state of the children involved. Uh, I mean, have we made any headway? Well, uh, <clears throat> thanks for the opportunity. So we got information. We had the privilege of uh, watching the documentary ahead of its premiere. And based on that, immediately we got our intelligence officers to liaise with the police who effected the arrest in Western North and then also in the Ashanti region. Okay. Uh, after the arrest, of course, interrogation is ongoing and then based on that, we'll be able, we'll be informed on the way forward. We are not the security agency. It is not within our remit to decide how the process should go. But of course, we are supposed to provide some sort of assistance to the security agencies in dealing with that, and which we are doing so. Mm. So that's about the arrest. But so, so far, how many people have been arrested? So far, our information is eight. They are, are, they are trying to identify other persons in the video. Okay. Because you see, if you watch the video, for example, in the Ashanti region, we were told that was a specific community. But because we have extension agents who deal with these farmers, they were able to identify that, yes, this specific district was mentioned, but actually they are not in this district, but in a different district, okay. and they were able to help the security agencies in inviting okay. them or arresting them for the necessary legal processes to take place. So yes, we are collaborating with the security agencies to ensure that anybody found to have involved himself in this act is dealt with. Okay. And uh, the children involved? Well, the children involved, um, we, we believe that there are other agencies that have the mandate and the capacity to handle situations like that. Mm -hmm. But whatever Cocoa Board is required to assist in that regard, Cocoa Board will definitely do so to, uh, with our agents in the various districts. Mm. So far, what um, kind of monitoring have you done? I mean, since you watched this documentary, with regards to the children involved and their safety? Well, we can say that um, the safety of the children at the moment, um, there's, there's no threat on their safety. But they are still working on those farms. They, we do not have information that they are working on those farms. However, 
uh, our checks also show that maybe the story is, is not exclusively as it is. Okay. There was one child specifically mentioned mm. in the documentary. After our further checks, we've been given report of the child from school, meaning that that child is actually in school. But, the, but that same child is the one who confessed in the documentary that um, she was in school, but when she came here, she stopped schooling. Yes, but then we have been given pictures of the child in school, his report card from school indicating that even though in the documentary we saw that child saying yeah. that he's not in school, but then the evidence that has been provided proves to the contrary. I'm not here in any way to justify that someone did something right or wrong, but I'm just giving you a feedback mm -hmm. based on the follow-up we have done. Okay. But it's to indicate to you that yes, we have not sat down and said that, well, the documentary is out there, it ends there. Okay. But we are actually doing a follow-up to ensure that really that what the documentary presented, what is the true state of it, and if there's any criminality, we ensure that the security agencies deal with it. Mm. Uh, Bright uh, raises a very critical point about stakeholders involved in the cocoa sector and which role uh, who plays what role so that uh, whenever issues like this come up, it will be easy for us to actually comprehensively deal with it. And um, the farmers, for instance, what role have you found out? What role they played in all of this? Uh, if, if you could rephrase your question, I, I don't quite understand. I'm saying that <laughs> the farmers the owners of the cocoa farms. Mm -hmm. How do they feel about all of this? And what is their role in this whole thing? Well, obviously, if a farmer decides to use a child in the cocoa farm, preventing the child from going to school, engaging in hazardous activity, obviously, that is not permissible and is not allowed. Mm. The farmer is not supposed to do that. So when a farmer does that, it's clearly committing an offense. Do, do you usually have an agreement or, I mean, how is the process done? Like cocoa farmers, you as a regulator, a regulator yeah. what, what is the, the process? Okay, so the farmer is a private person who has his or her farm. Okay. Cocoa board, as a regulator of the industry, we are supposed to ensure that people who engage in farming perform their farming activity within permissible uh, remits. Okay. So, for example, if you are a farmer, you are supposed to use these chemicals. If you are a farmer, you are not supposed to farm within a protected zone. If you are a farmer, you are not supposed to use children on your farms. You are supposed to keep your cocoa in a certain condition and all that. Mm. So we have extension officers who liaise with these farmers. One of the things we have done recently is that apart from teaching the farmers how they are supposed to cultivate or are supposed to keep their farm, they are actually supposed to do education such that the farmers will understand and appreciate the fact that if you are a farmer, you are not supposed to use children on your cocoa farms mm -hmm. because if you do so, that will be infringing on the law. Okay. This education has been ongoing. So if a farmer engages in such an act, obviously the farmer is aware that it's not permissible. But let us also understand the fact that it's a criminal act yeah. and crime exists almost in every society. What you rather do is to make it unattractive, to ensure that people do not engage in, and then when they do happen, the laws will apply. Mm. So to a very large extent, we are letting them understand that these are not the things they are supposed to do. In fact, if you watch the documentary, some of the farmers create the impression that, well, we are poor, I do not have the resources, and it's a justification for using the children. It, it gives an indication that, yes, there's the need for us to improve on the education. It also raises questions about your monitoring mechanisms. You see, if, if you talk about the monitoring mechanism, I, I agree that, yes, we are not able to identify every child in every community engaged in this act. Mm. But the truth is that this is also not an indication that it exists in every cocoa farm everywhere. Okay. That is not a situation. But prior to this documentary, I'm sure you must have heard uh, some of these issues around. You, you see, our engagement with farmers 
is something that goes on on a daily basis. There may be signs and signals that gives you an indication that maybe there's something wrong happening somewhere. Okay. And based on that, you take actions to remedy the situation. Mm. But the conclusion that, well, it's, an, it's a failure on the part of our monitoring system, I, I, I wouldn't want to agree with that mm. because there's a possibility that something may prop up somewhere else. Mm. But what is the percentage of that in totality? Mm. Yes, this has come up. It's an indication that the system is not foolproof, but it does not also mean that the system has failed. Uh, Bright gave you some indicators that show that indeed enrollment has increased. Mm. Number of children in school compared to what it used to be has changed. Mm. There's one thing we need to all understand. Okay. If a child is in school, the likelihood or the possibility that a child will be involved in child labor mm. is lower. Okay. Because if the child is already in school, at what time would the child be in the farm? Yeah. So the statistics and the programs and the interventions clearly demonstrate the fact that we cannot say that, well, we have failed, we have not lived up to the expectation. It's still an indication that there is some work to be done, but we should not in any way conclude that we have failed and all the interventions and all the effort put in has not yielded any results. Uh, Abna is back on. Uh, Abna, uh, have you seen uh, this, uh, this documentary and has the issue of uh, children, school children being trafficked at work on cocoa farms come to your notice? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, forgive my network. I keep getting in, um, cutting and then coming in, but I think I'll do my best and I hope you can hear me. Loud um, first of all, yes, I have seen the documentary and let me commend Joy FM and Quetenate. Quetenate is one of our trainees in terms of reporting human trafficking related issues. So I'm very glad um, that he has at least uh, made use of these trainings and then these issues are coming out. But um, let me take from where Mr. Colette and Bright came in. I think the issue of child labor and trafficking have come a long way. We cannot say in Ghana we've eradicated um, child labor and trafficking. But I think a lot more efforts have been put in and a lot more have been done. Yes, Ghana, we understand and we agree that there are pockets and incidents of um, child labor and trafficking. This is a very um, unfortunate and we are also happy that it has come out because, as you can see, the police have made some arrests. And so talking about arrests, let me um, start from that end as part of the four Ps that Mr. Colette spoke about. Um, over the years, if I can take the data from 2015, we could see that we had minimal prosecutions, minimal arrests. Um, of course, many um, issues came up in terms of the various phases of trafficking as to the root causes, people complaining about poverty and all that. But as we move on with various interventions and issues, we've realized that, yes, as you can see in the documentary, most of the farmers know that using children is a crime. But because they wanted cheap labor, they intended to use the kids. When you investigated, you realized that they never used their own children. They went for other children to use them. And so they know the importance of education, but decided to deny others this education. And so for... 2015 coming, we've made a lot of arrests in terms of people using um, children for labor and trafficking them. All the elements in terms of the act, the means and the purpose were present. And so these people will definitely go through the law and if they are found culpable, they will be prosecuted. We've prosecuted parents. I think the last 2021, um, a, two parents actually had 34 years. We can no longer say because you are a parent, the child is not a commodity that you can pick the child and just sell the child. No, a lot of effort have gone in. The Human Trafficking Fund has been operationalized. We have shelters. And so I was glad you we were asking about the safety of the children. As long as the social welfare has been involved and they are involved, they know the protocols and the standard operating procedures to follow. When victims are rescued, we have our shelters that are not disclosed and they'll be placed, they'll go through counseling, they'll go through and all the necessary support that they need will happen. Um, let me say this year, we did a lot of interventions. Um, a lot of interceptions also went on. Um, from the various areas that have been mentioned, including Bushebu area, 
most of yes traffickers still wanted to put on their tricks and to traffic but a lot of them were intercepted some have been prosecuted other cases are still in court and so some may happen at our blind side but as long as it comes to our notice the law says that whoever sees these things must report abna I, 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 i'm so wondering we can take action. abna i'm wondering that if you've really done this much work why are we still here um, definitely, you can understand that when it comes to crime, you will never be able to preempt a person who wants to commit a crime until the crime has been done. And so still farmers, I mean, um, like Bright said, there have been a lot of collaboration, coordination. The ministry has actually monitored, trained law enforcement. Over 200 law enforcement officers were trained this year to be able to identify issues of trafficking. And so this is to strengthen the various systems that we have. You, we have various units that we've established in the police, UOCO, immigration, and to ensure that they are able to fight or identify and understand the issues of trafficking. This year, we went to all the way to most of the border towns from Paga, because if there is still cross-border trafficking, there is still internal trafficking. We can do as much as we want to do to ensure that we reduce it to the lowest, barest minimum. To eradicate, we hope to get there soon, but I think it's not yet time because people still want, like I said, cheap labor. You can see they don't want to actually incur much cost. They know the incidents because there have been so much for co cooperatives, training, awareness creation. We, even as a ministry, this year alone, we did more than 38 community dialogues and engagement with these communities telling them about the incidents of child labor it impacts, it affects, it dangers. Mm. We went round the whole country. But aside, so right aside, now, most... aside um, telling these farmers what the dangers are and expecting them to also know the importance of education, what actually is the plan for these children? Because most of their parents cite poverty, uh, reason why they do that. And so, yes, if a child is rescued and we identify it after a risk assessment that these are some of the costs, we straight away go in as to whether the kind of support we need to give to these victims. Bright mentioned figures. We also have figures. Over 780 children were rescued this year alone. Some were intercepted, like I said. Others were actually withdrawn from the incidents. There are shelters. So those that need to be put back in schools are put back in school. Those that need vocational training are giving back vocational training. Those that need skills training, whatever they intend to do, depending on their age and what can be done is done. The parents are supported. Some um, recently at Ingo Pram Pram, over 10 parents were supported to establish businesses. After our investigations and we realized that they were not part of the trafficking syndicate, we needed to help the home. Most people are on leap. Most of these co cooperative farmers have complementary services that are given to them to ensure that they do not engage in child labor. And so some are on leave, some are given um, uh, productive inclusion, and all others. When we go, before you be enrolled on all these things, we are told not to use children. Mm. Of course, I mean, some um, exceptions can be told. There are so many CSOs, NGOs, including even the co companies, that are supporting farmers to ensure that child labor does not happen in our farms. Like I said, crime happens on the blind side, of course, of all people until it is revealed. Mm. You could see that he said he tricks. He changes and forged ID cards to outwit law enforcement officers. He also mentioned a whole lot of tricks. That is trafficking for you. It's about deception. It's about fraud. It's about painting setting a picture that does not exist and so on the blind side of the parent the parent thinks that oh i'm going to make something better out little or sometimes the parent don't even know that their children are going to be exploited and i keep saying children are in labor why are we still saying even there is unemployment because those who need to employ don't want to employ abled men that they need to pay. But whose they just job, want whose job is people. it? Whose job is it to ensure that they employ the right people? The laws are there. As long as it comes to an I don't think anybody has reported of any. I, I issue think the of chief labor, labor officer labor is here that with has us. Not been done. Uh, Mr. Kolete is there for us. Uh, Mr. Kolete, whose who's job is it? I believe it's yours to ensure people employ the right people to do the work. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yes, it is. You know, uh, we have said a lot. Uh, um, the various panelists have also said a lot about government intervention. Besides this, you are actually put duty. The Labor Department is to ensure that there is sanity at the employment space, and especially uh, decency at work have to actually be monitored and ensure that all players conform to the requirements of the law. Uh, importantly, the Labor Department undertakes various inspections. We call it establishment inspection. And this inspection is to ensure that employers comply with the legal provisions with government employment relationship in the country. More specifically, the provisions that are to be complied with in the, the, labor, the labor laws with government employment in this country. Um, we undertake labor inspection critically when F all the efficiencies that are manifested in the employment relationship in the various employment uh, regimes. So that is what we do. And under no circumstance will a labor officer actually see a child at work. No, under no circumstance. And I want to say here that the issue is a multifaceted uh, canker or menace and the need for collaboration and effective coordination is very important and key. The media has a major role to play when they get wind of some of these because as industry is expanding, the coverage becomes very difficult for the department to reach out to every corner of the country. But we expect that if we get volunteered information from our major stakeholders, we'll be able to reach out to some of these areas and ensure that there is sanity at the employment space. Um, Fifi, um, and I'm happy that he also talked about uh, the, uh, the facts about coordination because Bright Apia made mention of that. He talks about collaboration and all of this, um, the, the aim is to get sustainable uh, methods of you know dealing with these issues so that we don't tackle the issues as and when they happen I mean how do you intend to deal with this going forward well uh, I'm sure all the persons who have joined us uh, they've, from their uh, narrative you, you get the understanding that n no single institution is working in silo mm. there's a clear work relationship between Cocoa Board the ministry and then the private sector, of course the uh, cocoa companies that are also into sustainability programs. So a lot of work has been done. Education is ongoing and education and training is just one bit of it. Mm. There are other interventions that go out there to support cocoa farmers that are actually working and ensuring that there's child labor free in what they do. So there's some amount of money they are paid as a motivation and as an incentive to them. So that is also ongoing. So it is not a case that uh, there's one particular institution that has decided to work on its own and is not seeking the support and collaboration of other institutions. So there's a clear work plan which all of us are working towards. Of course, issues about child labor is not just restricted to the cocoa industry. Yeah. The ministry is there and then what the ministry's plan is, we all fit into it and then we are able to work with it. Of course, I, will, I wouldn't want to narrow it down to just what is happening in the cocoa industry. Yeah. There are other instances, like uh, one of the uh, panelists indicated. Mm. The person may come to you and say that, okay, well, give me your child. The child is going to work for me in a cocoa farm. Even if you watch the documentary, there was a mention of the fact that the child is actually helping in other forms okay. of child labor, mm -hmm. but then also supporting. But obviously, this documentary was about cocoa. That is why you get the impression that it's all in the cocoa industry. Yeah. But 
it is not a case that child labor is so predominant in our country such that everywhere you, you go, you find it. But the documentary... But, but, but it's quite um, worrying because, I mean, you, just like you mentioned, it's not only in the cocoa sector, it's in other sectors. And we've seen this over the period. But you see, um, a documentary, uh, all of us, at least the two of us, quite understand that if you put out a documentary, it gives you an indication of possibly what is happening. But it is not an indication that... This is what is happening in every part of our country. It could also give an indication it, it could, it, that it is, there it is are possible happening. That, that, that you is, know, that's a possibility. Which we are losing sight of. That is a possibility. So what this gives uh, the opportunity this gives us is that there is the need for us to go beyond what we have so done. So what this to explore. does is to actually open our eyes. That look, there are things that have been covered that we need to uncover. I think that's what it does. I, I you see. Just as the other panelists have said, whenever you are fighting crime, the perpetrators, what they do is to find different means of trying to outwit the people who are pursuing them. Yeah. So at every point in time, we cannot delude ourselves into thinking that the problem is entirely eradicated. Yeah. But we the, can reduce it to the barest minimum. As to the measure, I'm not sure the documentary has done a measure for us to say that, okay, so per the outcome of the documentary, this is an indication to say that it has been reduced from X to Y. But that's but it's an job but to it's a, actually but investigate but and know whether there are more. But it's an indication that, yes, there's still some work to be done. Definitely. And obviously, the Labor Ministry, the uh, institutions such as Cocoa Board and the private sector is not saying that, well, the problem is over, closed shop, Nothing is being done. Mm. Our extension agents are still educating the farmers. The people who are providing incentives and support, the training programs are ongoing. So the problem is still being dealt with. But this is an indication to us that the problem is not eradicated. Mm. You cannot rest on your oars, but you must pursue it further to ensure that you deal with it in totality. Mm. Mr. Bryce, up here, uh, should we change strategy? Because, I mean, just like Fifi said, uh, the programs are ongoing. Education is ongoing. All the things that are supposed to be done are ongoing. But we're still hearing some of these. Should we change strategy or we should approach things differently? I, I, I think that after the strategy is, is very apt, uh, what we need to change is the is the coordination and how all these institutions will work together to promote that, that common goal. Uh, clearly, uh, in 2018, the government of Ghana developed what we call the Ghana Child Labor Monitoring System, which is a very effective system that helps to even collect data on issues that are happening to children in the cocoa sector. And uh, even in a new chrome, as we speak, we have a community register on a new chrome. So we tried as much as possible to even go further to find out whether we can find the name of the of the of the child mentioned in the documentary. And I couldn't find it, but I came to the conclusion that probably they use a different name because of issues of uh, child protection. They use a different name for the child and all. But clearly, uh, when we put effort together. And where within a certain framework, we should be able to address this particular issue and all that. And for me, uh, the most important thing is that we should let uh, the stakeholders know the effort that government is putting in. On the basis of that, we have collected data in 1,075 communities, which very soon we have created a community register for all the communities that we work in. Uh, so very soon we'll be launching the Ghana Child Labor and Monitoring Report to see the intervention being provided by uh, uh, Cocoa Board, uh, the Child Labor Unit, uh, the Trafficking Unit, the, the, all the, the, the buying companies that are also supporting them and all that. So that will give you a clear picture of what government is doing. Government has provided a framework. But we'll also see situations where uh, uh, the, the, the work that must be done by some of these institutions are not really done well. Especially, I, I always say that I don't, I don't want to see the, the, the labor officer uh, 
uh, being uh, running an institution where they don't have resources to do it. Because I feel that if they get down to do uh, the work that is expected of them, uh, they would even get resources to run. Because one of the mandates given to them is to do labor inspection, the work, the, the, the workplace safety and all that, uh, to even determine if a child is below the age of 18 years. If the child is below the age of 18 years and is above uh, uh, 15 years, by law, the child can be employed and work in a safe environment. But so the, the Children's Act, even the ally, spelled out how the, the chief labor officer must take records of children that work in, 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 within those institutions. But for some time now, we don't, we don't get that records from them as to whether they are able to document that and whether they have been able to prosecute the institutions that have engaged children to work, but they have not provided a safety measure for them to work in that environment and all that. So these are things. And, and let me give credit to the trafficking unit of... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, gender, children, and social protection. They've done comprehensive work. And this is why, why I was a bit worried when Kuku Board announced that they've, they've done arrest, because there are certain issues that if you strictly want to apply the criminal concept, you don't get the kind of resource that you want in terms of even prosecuting them. And I can say in authority that even the eight people that they've arrested I can say on authority that not all of them will be prosecuted because they will not have enough evidence to be able to uh, prosecute them and all that. Because some of the underlying issues are, are really social and attitudinal. Mm -hmm. So once they are, we are able to address some of these issues, I think that we should be able to, uh, to do very well. And then also urge Coco Board to enforce compliance. Uh, they've done a lot of things. I, I have records of things that they've done in the Coco Green sectors. And then how even they are transforming their extension officers to also have the component of child protection in terms of the work that they do. So those records are there. So gradually, we are moving to a situation where if you work within a certain environment and you recognize that or you, you realize that children are participating in that environment, then it means that you also have to invoke another lens to see what people are doing with children within that sector. And for me, it is a plus. The police... Uh, uh, in, uh, also doing that through the training provided to them by the trafficking unit. Uh, uh, I also know that NGOs have been trained to also understand how some of these things work and all that. Mm. So uh, I feel that this documentary uh, has exposed something that uh, we should not, personally didn't want to attempt to criticize it because I feel that it, it's a reality. Mm. There are communities that we have identified trafficking issues and then we have reported it to the police and they've taken action. Mm. There are communities that we have also realized that they don't have child, child labor situation, especially when it comes to the work forms of child labor and then the unconditional work forms of child labor and all that. And those communities are also in the list of the data that we have collected. So, so certainly it's, also, yeah, it's an issue uh, that we must collectively deal with. Uh, let exactly. me give, I just have one minute. Let me give it to Fifi to wrap it up for me. He mentioned um, compliance. Um, how do you intend to deal with that? See, um, the information about this documentary came out on Friday. And by, on Sunday, the arrest had been taken, had taken place. It's an indication to you that... Uh, we know who these farmers are and where they are. Mm. At the extent to which Cocoa Board engage these farmers. So it is not a case that we've gone to sleep and that we are not monitoring them. Okay. We know who these farmers are because we have agents who visit these farmers. In fact, there's an officer in Ashanti region, PR Interaction, who tells us that even on the day where the team was in the region or in the district to record, he actually met them mm. and asked them their mission there. So on a daily basis, they do interact with these farmers. It is possible that you, might, you will find persons who will not go according to the prescribed, who will not act within the confines of the law. But it is for us to ensure that when they do so, we'll get the laws to deal with them. We shall continue with the education. Now we are doing a farmer database system that is able to help us in tracking them better than what we are doing now. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, whenever the issues come up, we'll definitely get them dealt with. And also address the um, root cause, uh, which Bright talks about. Some of them 
has to do with uh, social issues, poverty and what have you. Also deal with that. But that will be all uh, for PM Express. I'm grateful for your time, Fifi. I'm grateful, uh, Bright Up here, uh, Abna and uh, Mr. Kolete. Uh, enjoy the rest of our programs.